This video shows how to install and harden a minimal Linux system on a Raspberry Pi. The next video will show how to install a honeypot. The major sections of this video are here with their timestamps. So if you already know how to do one of these steps, you can skip ahead. Section 2 Install a minimal Linux. You will need a Raspberry Pi 4 a Debian 11 bullseye image for the Pi 4, these instructions or the shortened checklist. I put links for all of these things in the video notes. We choose to use a Raspberry Pi 4 because it is cheap and available. We choose to use a minimal Linux instead of a full featured Pi Linux like Kali or Raspbian because it is easier to harden configure and maintain a minimal Linux. We start by burning the Pi image to a micro SD card. I'm going to show the Linux process here. Windows instructions are included in the checklist. I'm using my laptop Linux system because it has a micro SD card interface. I've previously downloaded the Debian 11 Pi 4 image. I start by typing sudo f disk dash l and noting the I note the list of devices. Then I can insert the micro SD card into my laptop, give it a minute or two to settle down and reissue the F disk command and look to see what's changed. I now have a new thing listed down here. It's about 30 gigs which matches the size of the SD card. So this is the name of my micro SD card device on my Linux system. My Linux system auto mounts uh, file systems if it sees something it recognizes. So I'm going to forcefully unmount whatever it auto mounted before I begin the burn. I don't like trying to do a low level burn of stuff to a file system, to a mounted file system. It's too likely to end in errors. Okay, at this point I should be good to go. So I cut and paste the burn command from the checklist. You can, I put a link to this checklist in the video notes. You can download it and just follow along with the checklist. I have to replace the name of the device with the name of my micro SD card device and then I should be good to go. It takes it a couple minutes to burn 1.6 gigs of data to the micro SD card that I've inserted. I've finished burning 1.6 gigs of data to that micro SD card. It created a couple of file systems and my laptop auto mounted those file systems again. So I need to forcefully unmount them. And now that they're unmounted, I can just pop out the S micro SD card, insert it into the Raspberry Pi 4 hook up a keyboard, an HDMI monitor, and power, and boot the Pi 4. The initial boot of this Debian system will take a couple of minutes. The system has to initialize a bunch of stuff, but when it's done, the Pi 4 will boot to a bare-bones Linux system. There is only the root user, it has no password, there is only the command line, and there are minimal installed packages. Section 3. Harden and configure a minimal Linux. Well, first you log in as root and then change the root password. Everybody needs something to keep track of their passwords. Some people use paper notebooks. I like to use the KeyPass password manager. You should make an entry for the Pi 4 in your password manager and 
add the root user to that description and the password you just created to that description. Next, plug in an active wired Ethernet connection and then reboot. This system only configures its network interfaces on boot. Wait until the system is finished rebooting. It should go faster this time and log in as root again. Once you're in, check the net wired interface configuration with IPA. You should have a functional internet connection via ETH0. And there's your IP address. It should look something like this. Now do an initial update of the OS using apt update and apt upgrade. If you just barely downloaded this firmware image, then there will be nothing to update. Those firmware images get updated every day, but it's still good to check. Next step is create an unprivileged user. This user will be used for SSH connections. It will also host the unprivileged code. I'm going to turn this pie into a honeypot, so I will call this user Honey. You also should give it a different strong password. We'll deal, deal with the locale warnings in a later step. You should add this username and password to the PI4 entry in your password manager. Next, set up and harden the SSH protocol. Once we're finished, we will control the system via SSH. We should only need a direct keyboard connection in an emergency. First, check the state of the SSH service. Then check the network status of the SSH server. You can ignore lines for 60, port 68, that's a DHCP. You're interested in the ones for port 22. They tell you that the SSHD program is listening for connections via both TCP and which is IPv4 and TCP6, which is IPv6. Configure the SSH server's global configuration file at slash etsy slash ssh slash sshd underscore config. Look for the line that says port 22. Make sure it's uncommented. Change the port number away from 22. I have to move it away from 22 so the Honeypot software can use 22. Don't pick a new port that looks or sounds like 22. Just pick a random port number between 1025 and 65K. Moving away from the default port is a good thing for virtually everything you do. It blocks and delays most automated attack. But you have to remember which port number you picked. You need it to connect to your system. So you should add the IP address of the system and the port number of the SSH server to the description of the PI4 in your password manager. For this video, I changed it to port 52196. Next, find the keyword that says permit root login and change it to no. Make sure it's uncommented. If it says anything else, just change it to no. This stops attackers from using the known root username. Next, add the allow users keyword. And let's put it right about here.
This, the value here is a list of usernames separated by spaces. In this example, I created a user called Honey, so this line will look like allow users Honey. After this change, only the usernames on this list can log in to SSH. Find the keyword that says address family, uncomment it. The default any is fine. It allows SSH connections via both IPv4 and IPv6. But if you know you're only going to connect via IPv4, then you should change it to address family INET. And then it will only allow connections via IPv4. Exit Nano and save your changes by hitting Control X. Now edit the default SSH client config file with nano. Uh, first step is an optional one. If you know you're only going to be talking to IPv4 hosts, then change the address family to INET. Next, find the line that says hash known hosts and change it from yes to no. The SSH client saves SSH server fingerprints in your home directory at tilde slash dot SSH slash known hosts. By default, it obscures the server address or host name in that file. But that makes it difficult to remove a single entry when a server fingerprint has a legitimate change. Next, find the line that says visual host key, uncomment it, and change it to yes. After you do that, uh, the client will create an ASCII art representation of the server fingerprint when you connect. These images are easier to remember and compare than a long string of hexadecimal numbers. After you finish making those changes, exit Nano and save your changes by hitting Control X. Yeah. Now comes a moment of truth. If you made too many mistakes, then the SSH server or client will act strange or refuse to connect or refuse to start. Restart the SSH server. CTL restart SSHD.service. Make sure it's running. Units. And check to see if the port numbers have changed and it's using your new port. So now SSHD is running on port 52196, the one I changed it to. Finally, you should test the SSH client by uh, connecting to the loopback address. So SSH honey at 127.0.0.1 P52196. And there's the ASCII art uh, image of the server key fingerprint. Terminate the SSH connection with the exit command. Now that we've finished hardening SSH, the next step is to install the IP tables firewall interface. The firewall will control who and what can connect to your Pi. By this point you should be remotely SSHing to the Pi 4. It's a lot easier to cut and paste these commands into an SSH session. So let's become privileged and type the root password. Next, install the IP tables. IP table.
avance. Next step is to configure a persistent IP tables firewall for IPv4 and an IP6 tables firewall for IPv6. Uh, in this case I need an IPv4 firewall that allows connections from a trusted area to the configured SSH server, allows connections from anywhere to the SSH honeypot, and drops all other incoming IPv4 connections. So the quick way to do that is to paste in the following lines from the checklist. After you make these changes, the IPv4 firewall rules should look like uh, this. Tables dash which basically says allow me to make outgoing connections and any response to those connections let back in let things from a trusted area get to the SSH server on my changed port and let anybody connect to the honeypot on port 22. Next we want to create a similar IPv6 firewall by pasting in the commands from the checklist again. After you make these changes, the IPv6 firewall looks like this. Let's see, IP6 tables. Dash. Basically, the IPv4 and the IPv6 firewalls are configured to do the same things. You usually like consistency here. These commands make a temporary change to the Pi 4. These changes only last until another privileged command changes the firewall rules or the next reboot. So I like to save the current firewall rules by installing a package called IP tables persistent. Save the current rules, yes indeed, both for IPv4 and IPv6. The uh, IP tables persistent package saves firewall rules to slash etsy slash IP tables. And there's the rules for four version IPv4 and IPv6. From now on, the saved rules will be loaded every time the system boots. So <laughs> you should probably verify that you can still SSH from a trusted area to the Pi 4. Congratulations! You now have a hardened minimal Linux. You can use this as a base for many projects. In the next video, I show you how to turn this system into an SSH honeypot.